OK, so we're going to look at fifth powers. So you spot there's an interesting pattern here that 1 to the power of 5 ends in 1, 2 to the power of 5 ends in 2, and so on. And actually this pattern continues beyond what I've written here. So 7 to the power of 5 ends in 7, so does 8 to the power of 5 ends in 8, 9 to the 5 ends in 9. Then when we get to 10 to the 5, it doesn't end in 10, so it doesn't end 1, 0 but it does still end in 0, and similarly for 11 to the 5, it doesn't end 1, 1, so it doesn't end in 11, but it does have a 1 as its last digit, and similarly for 12, 13, 14, 15, they all have the same last digit. So it seems like there's some pattern we could try to prove here that if you raise a number to the power of 5, you still get the same last digit. So this is quite exciting because there's so many different ways we could approach this sort of proof. We could try a proof by induction, we could try splitting up into different cases, depending on what the last digit of our number is. We could even use modular arithmetic or some more advanced tools from number theory. So for example, we could use Fermat's Little Theorem or Euler's Theorem. But the proof I'm going to present is going to be one that is essentially equivalent to what we would do using modular arithmetic. But I like this because it doesn't require any of that specific knowledge. So it's a very simple proof using some factorization. So what we're actually trying to show is that n to the power of 5 and n always have the same last digit. So you could think about if they've got the same last digit, what happens when you take away n from n to the power of 5? Well, the last digits are the same, so they would cancel out, so this would end in 0. So what we're effectively trying to show then is that n to the power of 5 minus n ends in 0, or equivalently, we want to show that this is a multiple of 10. So this is where we can now try and prove this. So we'll have a go at factorising n to the 5 minus n and see if we can show this is a multiple of 10. So first of all we can take out a factor of n, we get n into n to the 4 minus 1, then n to the 4 minus 1 is a difference of two squares, so we can write this as n times n squared plus 1 times n squared minus 1. And again n squared minus 1 is also a difference of two squares. We can write this as n plus 1 and n minus 1. So let me just rewrite these in a more sensible order now. So you have n minus 1 times n, that's n plus 1, and n squared plus 1. So now that we've factorised this, the idea is that in order to show that this is a multiple of 10, we'll first show that it's a multiple of 2, then we'll show that it's a multiple of 5, which would prove then if you've got a multiple of 2 that's also a multiple of 5, this would mean that n to the 5 minus n has to also be a multiple of 10. So how do we know that this is going to be a multiple of 2? Well, we're going to take advantage of the fact that in the factorisation, we've got n minus 1, n, and n plus 1, so three consecutive integers, which are all factors of n to the 5 minus n. So if you imagine just picking three consecutive integers, you can immediately see that there's no way of doing this without having at least one of them as an even number or a multiple of 2. So in fact if you only had two consecutive integers this would still guarantee that one of them was a multiple of 2. So that means we've got a multiple of 2 which is a factor of n to the 5 minus n. So this is definitely a multiple of 2. So what about showing that it's a multiple of 5? So we've got these three consecutive integers so we may well get for example 4, 5, 6 or 3, 4, 5. You may well get a multiple of 5 as one of these three. But you can also see there are potentially some problems. So you could have 6, 7, 8, or maybe 7, 8, 9, where none of these three integers are a multiple of 5, and the proof doesn't seem to work. However, we have still got this n squared plus 1 term. So what we'll do is we'll consider the five consecutive integers n minus 2, n minus 1, n, n plus 1, and n plus 2. So maybe this n squared plus 1 term can help us out. You can see that if any of n plus 1, n, or n minus 1 are a multiple of 5, then we've got that n to the 5 minus n is definitely a multiple of 5. And if not, then 1 of n minus 2 or n plus 2, because we've now got 5 consecutive integers, 1 of these two must be a multiple of 5, if none of these in the middle are. So in either case, with n plus 2 or n minus 2, we can say n minus 2 is perhaps some multiple of 5, call it 5k, or we've got n plus 2 is equal to 5 times some integer k. So in either case, we get n is equal to 5k plus or minus 2. 
So what does this mean for our n squared plus 1 term? Well, if n is 5k plus or minus 2, then n squared plus 1 is 5k plus or minus 2 all squared plus 1. Then expanding the brackets here, the 5k squared gives us 25k squared. Then in either case, it's plus 2 times 2 times 5k or minus 2 times 2 times 5k. So we just have plus or minus 20k. Then the plus 2 or the negative 2, when we square this, we just get a positive 4 in either case. So plus 4 plus 1, which gives us a plus 5. So now we can take out a factor of 5, and you see that this is indeed a multiple of 5, as we were hoping. So we get 5 into 5k squared plus or minus 4k plus 1. And you see that n squared plus 1, then, is a multiple of 5 in this case, where none of n minus 1, n, or n plus 1 is a multiple of 5. So we've actually shown then that n to the 5 minus n must be a multiple of 5. We either have, it's nice and easy if any of these three are a multiple of 5, but if not, then this guarantees that n squared plus 1 is also a multiple of 5. So n to the 5 minus n has to be a multiple of 5, and it also has to be a multiple of 2. So we can conclude that this is a multiple of 10, which means that n to the 5 and n, whatever your value of n is, as long as it's an integer, will have the same last digit.